This is an authentic pair of British ammo boots that was manufactured in 1942, so 80 years ago, for World War II. And we're gonna cut them in half to see how they're built and how the British Army, what, what kind of boots they wore. And more importantly, did, did they really make boots better back 80 years ago than they do today? Or is that all just revisionist history and wanting the past to be better than what it actually was? We're gonna find out by cutting it in half and seeing how this thing's built. This video is sponsored by Victoria Cast Iron. And if you like this channel, there's a good chance you'll like this cast iron because cast iron is essentially the same thing that we love about higher quality boots and shoes, but in cooking form. Because it is like the old school way of doing it. It's the high quality, the heavy duty materials. And there's certain benefits you get from cast iron that you don't get from the cheap $5 aluminum pan you get from Walmart. They retain the heat really well, they heat evenly, they're heavy duty, you season them, and it's 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 really, it's crazy how good of a sponsor this is because it's the same way that people wear and season their boots by conditioning them, same thing with cast iron. And Victoria is a family owned company that was founded in 1939 in Colombia, and, and they still make all of their cast iron in Colombia by the same family three generations later. And they season all their cookware with European kosher flaxseed oil, which is the best base, the best seasoning you can use for or seasoning at cast iron it comes pre-seasoned which is really nice and they have a lifetime warranty on all their products which is always a good sign of a company that believes in their products and for a limited time if you follow my link in the description and use the code 10 rose anvil you can get 10 percent off of victoria cast iron dutch ovens and the coupons only available for the next 30 days so go get yourself a cast iron Dutch oven, I think you guys would like. If you if you like the stuff that we do on this channel, you're gonna like cast iron if you don't already love it. These boots have a pretty interesting history because they were manufactured by the John White Shoe Company. Uh, they were based out of Northampton, England, which used to be a huge footwear manufacturing capital of the world. And the Northampton factories were a pivotal player in equipping the British Army for World War II. And you might not know that now because Northampton no longer is a shoe capital. There's still a few holdouts there that are still maintaining that uh, history of high quality footwear being manufactured in Northampton, England, like Crown Northampton and a few others that I can't remember. But it used to be one of the footwear capitals of the world and John White used to be one of the best of the best. So what makes this pair of John White World War II ammo boots so special? Well, to give you a brief history of the John White Shoe Company and how it played into World War II. So in 1919, the founder of John White, whose name is John White, had been working in the footwear industry for 23 years. And at the age of 35, he decided to start his own footwear company and made his first pair of John White shoes. By 1921, he had 125 workers working on 6,000 pairs per week. And then by 1930, they had really made their name in the market by making some of the most durable, the longest lasting, well-made boots and the most impregnable boots in the world. And that's the word they used to market these boots was impregnable because they were so well built. And by the end of the decade, John White had 2000 employees and was operating nine factories. So they were pretty big. And so when it came time to equip the British army for World War II, they went straight to John White because of their how big their factory was and because of how high quality the footwear that they made was and the name associated with them. So by 1941, John White had all nine factories working and that staff of 2000 people who produced three million pairs per year in total John White produced one ninth of all the footwear supplied to the British forces. And that was around 8 million pairs over the course of the war, which is crazy. And in our research, we kind of got lucky with this one because the John White boots were some of the best of the best. All the soldiers coveted them and, and they were trading cigarettes around trying to get a pair of John Whites because even though they made a, a large portion of the boots for World War II, it still was only one out of eight or one out of nine soldiers had a pair. And because they were such higher quality than the rest of them, and because the British military was basically commissioning whoever could make a boot to make boots, including civilian manufacturers that didn't have huge factories. So having a pair of John Whites was not only something that you knew you could trust the quality, but also you, because of how big the, the operation was and because of how streamlined it was, you knew that it was consistent. So no matter what, if you saw the John White stamp on the inside of your boot, that you knew that there's a good chance that this boot was gonna last you a long time and it wasn't gonna fail you. And it was a boot that you could trust and potentially barter for, for whatever you wanted. So kind of interesting that we just accidentally got one of the most coveted boots of World War II. And it is, it is kind of interesting to even look back at World War II and see that even during wartime, there were some hype beasts out there coveting certain brands and certain models and or certain certain styles because of the quality. So what made these boots so coveted by all the British soldiers? Well, let's start with the leather first because this is an interesting leather because it is a full rough out boot, which means that smooth grain texture that usually is on the outside is flipped to the inside. And that really fibrous suede 
textures on the outside. And the reason they did that was suede is a lot more abrasion resistant than the grain side. And that's why a lot of the high-end uh, work boot manufacturers, their work boots a lot of times are rough out because you know, it's, it's just a lot harder to cut through loose fibers than it is a really tightly packed, a really tight grain pattern right here. And we'll put some, I'll put some footage over top so you can see what I mean. And you can see on this boot where it's similar to the jack boot that we did last time. They issued these boots non-black and, and it was a soldier's responsibility to blacken them to the uniform standard with shoe polish and whatever else they had to pigment the boots. And as for the thickness of this leather, it feels really stiff and thick, but it's really 2.3, 2.4 mill millimeters thick. So pretty average for a light duty work boot. And if we compare that thickness to a modern equivalent in the Red Wing Iron Rangers, it's about 2.4. And the first thing we noticed when we got this was how stiff this leather is. And obviously it's an 80 year old boot and the leather dries out over time if you don't condition it and wear it. But it was, it's so stiff and we just were like, oh, maybe it's just old. But then doing the research for this video, we came across a lot of stories of people talking about how stiff these boots were when, you, when they first got them and the different ways and techniques that people used to break them in faster. And one of them was disgusting. They basically just peed in the boot and then drained it out, um, conditioned it and polished it, let it sit overnight and then wore it the next day. And allegedly that helped break the boots in and made them a little bit softer. I don't know if it's the ammonia in the pee or if it's just an old wives tale that people just kept doing. and. I don't know. So maybe one day we'll do a, a little experiment to, and try that to see if it actually does help. It'd be disgusting, but sometimes you gotta make sacrifices. So overall, it's a pretty good quality leather. And the thing about this leather, it wasn't built for comfort. It was built to last. And that's part of why these were so hard to break in is because they were prioritizing a boot that's gonna last you in the war over how it looks and how it feels. And so, and so they continued that same idea all the way through the entire shoe. Like if you look at the outsole of this, you can see on the outsole, they've got these hobnails. And to show you what a hobnail actually looks like, we pulled one of these out and it's literally just a little nail that goes in there. And I don't know how they stayed in there so well. Maybe they had to replace them a lot, but these hobnails were made to extend the life of the boot because leather wears down so quickly and it's really slippery. They threw these hobnails on there for all the marching and the, the traveling that you wear down the metal first instead of the actual outsole because you can just hammer new hobnails in there versus doing a whole resole out on the field. So once again, they're prioritizing durability and longevity over the comfort and the use of the boot because I can't imagine hobnails were the most comfortable thing to march in. And one interesting thing is over time throughout the war, they reduced the amount of hobnails in each boot. So they started with over 25, then dropped it to 25, then to 15. And by 1942, they only had 13 hobnails. So being manufactured in 1942, this has more hobnails than it should. So I'm, I'm guessing someone just hammered some extra hobnails in there at some point. But another interesting thing is it also has the wooden pegs that we saw in, in the, the German boot where these wooden pegs hold this boot together. And the interesting thing is this one is sewn all the way through. So it doesn't even really need those wooden pegs, but it does help because with those wooden pegs in there, even if you do wear through the stitching, those, those wooden pegs are still gonna hold all those layers together. And then as for the heel, more hobnails, but I don't know what these studs in the heel are. I don't know if those are nails that go up through to hold the, hold the heel block on, or if it's another form of protection from wear, I'm not sure. So we'll see if we get it cut in half. And speaking of the construction, these are built in the same way that the highest quality boots are made today with a 270 degree Goodyear welt, where that welt is sewn on and stitched all the way through the outsole, attaching the outsole and all the layers to the upper. And then at the heel, the stitching stops and the upper is still tucked underneath, but there's a bunch of nails going through that, that clinch over, holding all those layers together. And it's kind of crazy that almost a hundred years later, that the best boots are still made in this exact same way. You know, some people still use, some people use a 360 Goodyear weld, some people use a stitch down, but essentially it's, this is, this is, this is the exact same boot as like an Iron Ranger. And you know, Iron Rangers aren't work boots, but if you look at like some Nicks or some Whites, they're the heaviest duty work boots in the world and they're built almost identically. And, and one really cool thing I noticed about this boot, I was looking at how, how tight that stitch density is on the upper. And then I noticed you can still see a few of the little, uh, lines caused by that roller on the sewing machine that sewed this upper together 80 years ago. I just love that you can see the, the fingerprints of the manufacturing and the person that made this boot 80 years ago. So right off the bat, this seems like it's just as good of a boot as any, basically any boot we've cut apart on the channel. But that doesn't always mean that's the case on the inside. There could be some stuff hiding on the inside. So let's cut this thing in half and see how good of a boot this really is.
Okay, I got it cut in half, and this one did not smell as bad as the German boot, but still is pretty stinky. So let's see what's inside. These really might be the highest quality boots that we've ever cut apart on the channel. It has a crazy amount of the features that we see in these six to seven hundred dollar boots. You've got that full leather insole, you've got the cork filling, it's a true Goodyear welt. You've got that thick leather midsole. You have a wooden shank, which some people would argue isn't the best, but it makes sense for World War II, the rationing metal. And because of how many layers of leather on the inside of here, the wooden shank is a little, even already a little redundant because you look at all these high quality work boots that use a leather shank, that's the same amount of layers with the leather shank. So it essentially already has a leather shank in it and the wooden shank is just extra support. You can also see how big and how thick these nails were that were driven all the way through the boot, holding it all together. You can see right here the perfect example of what those wooden pegs do and how they hold that all together because that is a seamless transition from leather to wood. You can't even see a crack in there. That's because it swells and compresses in the exact same rate as leather does. The toe stiffener is a leather toe stiffener. It just has all the features that you would expect to see in the highest quality boots that you can buy today, plus some extras. Is it actually that much higher quality? You know, you have a, this point of diminishing return with every little little bit of improvement you make on a boot. I'd be, I'd be willing to bet if someone recreated this boot in the same way, in the same um, area, in, in Northampton with all the same materials, it'd probably cost you a thousand bucks, if not more. And this boot was made 80 years ago in mass production. So it wasn't like this was a handmade bespoke shoe that was just like perfectly designed. It was like, these were, they were pumping these out to get as many out as possible to, to equip their soldiers. And it's still one of the highest quality boots ever. So then to the big question, did they make better boots back in the day 80 years ago compared to the modern boots? I would say yes. So the saying of they don't make them like they used to seems to be true with these boots. And part of that, part of the whole thing with this is as time went on, they even talked about this with the John White company is like even in 1940 or even before that, they were talking about how all this mass production is dropping quality and they're, they're not the standard of quality that it used to be. And John White kind of made their name on bringing back quality to footwear. And so that was happening 100 years ago and it's still happening today and I think that's a huge part of why these boots are a superior boot than modern boots because over time manufacturing just gets streamlined they cut out a lot of the fluff that's not necessary and they're everyone's chasing margins at the end of the day and a lot of times quality suffers and this video isn't to say that these Pacific Northwest boots or these Indonesian boots or these Japanese boots all these really nice handmade boots are inferior it's more of a way to appreciate those boots because those companies are making boots to the standard of what they used to be. And to me, that makes me appreciate these boots a lot more and some of these higher quality boots that we've cut apart from these companies that are maintaining the quality of boots that a lot of people want. So this video really caught me by surprise because I did not expect this boot to be as high quality as it is. Oh, and one little bonus thing I just noticed as I'm wrapping this up, you can see there's a little repair done on the back of the boot right there. Kind of interesting. But yeah, crazy video. I love this video. Let me know what else you guys want us to cut apart when it comes to historical boots. We got the Japanese boot coming up and the Japanese boot might rival this one in quality. So we'll see. And uh, so thank you guys for everything you do. And thank you so much for supporting these videos because these are right now my favorite videos to do because of, because of the historical significance and because we're, we're seeing things and learning things that I don't know if anyone has ever seen before. And it puts a lot of the modern footwear in perspective by seeing where we came from in footwear. So thank you guys so much for everything. See ya.